So, welcome everyone to this wonderful afternoon to the sunny outside, so thanks for coming in to a place where it's not so bright anymore, so that we are coming back to stars and planets in a, in a second. So, Christopher Mazzini is giving us the um, colloquium this afternoon. So, a colloquium, which also will be part of this requirement for habilitation here in, uh, in, in Heidelberg. So, uh, watch how good he will be speaking and presenting the science. So, uh, Christoph graduated in 2008 at the University of Bern, where he had been working with Willy Benz, who is also external scientific member of the Max Planck Institute here on the mountain. Uh, after 2008, he came to Heidelberg, where a little bit later he got an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship. So his research was funded. He has stayed here since. And this morning we were notified that in the future he will be a Weimar um, Lust Fellow of the Max Planck Society, so that he gets funding, his funding secured for a little more years. So congratulations on this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrich. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure for me uh, to speak this afternoon here about uh, land formation and evolution, uh, statistical comparisons with observations. This is work I have done together with my collaborators, both here in Heidelberg, but also some at the University. I hope you can hear me like that. Is that loud enough? Okay. Fine. It's fine. Good. Uh, let me give you a, an overview of this uh, talk. I will give first an introduction into the subject and then the reason why we do this kind of studies. Then I will introduce to you the global planet formation and evolution model. Uh, and then I will give you an insight in some of the results that can be obtained with such kind of models. Uh, model in particular, results on the planetary initial mass function. Then uh, I will talk about the mass radius relationship of planets. I will then uh, show you the impact of uh, the opacity of grains during the formation phase and to uh, observable quantities. Finally, I will talk about the evaporation of primordial hydrogen helium atmospheres. And then I will give you my conclusions. So the motivation for um, this talk is, of course, that we would like to better understand uh, the planet formation process. Qualitatively, it is relatively simple to make such a schematic uh, overview of planet formation. You all know this starts, of course, in the disk around the young star, which consists of gas and dust. The dust is initially a uh, very small micrometer size. Then we go in the first step to planetesimals, kilometer-sized objects, uh, probably we don't know that very well, through uh, um, calculative processes. Once we are at the kilometer scale, gravity becomes uh, the dominant force and we can go to protoplanets which are of more than 1,000 kilometers in size. A number of these protoplanets uh, grow sufficiently massive during the presence of the protoplanetary disk that they can create a large amount of hydrogen helium from the surrounding nebula, transforming themselves into giant planets. This happens on a time scale of 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 7 years. A process which is becoming important uh, in this time is orbital migration, which is due to the exchange of angular momentum between the growing protoplanets and the surrounding gases. Most of these uh, kind of protoplanets, however, do not grow sufficiently massive to become giant planets. Instead, they remain relatively small, and once the protoplanetary disk uh, is, go, is gone, they undergo a series of giant impacts to settle into an orbital configuration and to form terrestrial planets and to settle, in, thank you, to, uh, to settle into a dynamical uh, situation which is stable over long timescales. This, what I'm showing you, is basically the classical bottom-up paradigm of planet formation, and especially this pathway here is called the core accretion paradigm. But, in fact, even if we show just such a simple overview, there are several steps which are not certain at all. For example, this step for the planetesimal formation, recent studies indicate that maybe, instead of here a cooperative process, a self-instability in the dust layer is involved, so we're building these protoplanets directly. And also for the formation of the giant planets, there is an alternative theory, which is the direct formation, again, through self-gravity, that's the gravitational instability theory. If we want to quantify these processes, 
we understand quickly that this is not a trivial exercise. And this is due to this following reasons. First of all, we are facing a huge dynamical range in size or mass. So we're going from grains to giant planets. That's are really many orders of magnitude. But then it's also a huge dynamical range in time, so between 10 to 100 million years, and this means an equal large amount of dynamical time scans at 1 AU. And this tells us that we cannot directly simulate, for example, the collisional growth through n body integration. That's very difficult. Uh, third, there is a lot of different physics which is important here. Gravity, obviously, but also hydrodynamics, radiative transport, thermodynamics, magnetic fields, and material properties which are typically encoded into an equation of state. These different processes are often strongly nonlinear. An example is the runaway growth of a solid core where a big core goes even faster. That's an example. And another uh, complication is that these different mechanisms, they can all interact with each other and feedback. And one example here is the my orbital migration, which I told you, where both the disk uh, the gas disk and the planet interact and uh, where we cannot separate the two effects from each other. This complexity means that it is relatively difficult to uh, explain planet formation purely from first principles. And instead, theory needs some observational guidance. And that's exactly the motivations for this work. Fortunately, in the last uh, 20 years or so, there was a huge progress or in um, the amount of statistical constraints we have. This is, of course, the semi-major axis versus mass, one of the most important representations of exosolar planets, almost similar as the hertz progression diagram for stars. And what you can see here is, of course, the position of the solar system. When we look at this diagram nowadays, this is more or less how it looks, and we have all these hundreds, 700, 700 points, more than 2,600 additional candidates from the Kepler uh, uh, satellite. It is, of course, already difficult to uh, get all these points, and I was involved in, in finding some of, of these planets here. But now that we have all these uh, statistical constraints, we can start to study it. And the first thing we certainly noti not notify is the extreme diversity we have here. So we have some objects uh, like the super Jupiters, we then have the hot Jupiters, and finally, we have here these lower mass objects, these super Earths and hot Neptunes. Of course, we can now start to characterize this, uh, these planets uh, no more just a single object, but as a population by a number, oops, by a number of distributions. And what we wonder as a theoretician is can we understand uh, the structure we see here? Because of course there's not just diversity, there is also some structure. You have to be careful, there are observational biases. But we see, for example, it seems that there is an over density here, so the absence there, maybe also there. There is a this is so we would like to understand. And the basic hypothesis is here that all these objects have formed with the same formation mechanism, but with different initial conditions. This might be not correct, but that's something we want to study. A second motivation to do this work is more specific. And this is because in the last maybe five years, there was a strong uh, movement in the observations from the mere discovery to a first geophysical characterization of the extrasolar planets. And this is shown here in this figure here, you will see it again. So here we have the mass of a planet and here we have the radius, so we need measurement by typically a transit and by radial velocity, and then we can start to, uh, to show the planets in this, this plot, and you can see that they seem to follow a certain, uh, here, a certain line, and what is now interesting is that we can compare that with theoretical predictions, and we will do that later on. So, for example, these are theoretical lines for solid planets of a given composition, and here for planets consisting of hydrogen and helium uh, at different semi-major axes. Besides transit, there are also new observations by direct imaging and also spectroscopy, so probing the composition of the atmosphere. And these new techniques bring new observational constraints, so the radius obviously, but then the bulk and the atmospheric composition and from direct imaging also the intrinsic luminosity of these planets. And what we would like to do 
is to compare our theoretic results with as many observational results as possible because only then we can be sure that we just because it could be that we just uh, reproduce some of these constraints, but the other, uh, not the other ones, from a different technique. What this also means is that your theoretical model should be able to predict as many basic observables as possible. And this that I mean the semi-major axis, the mass, but also the radius, the luminosity, composition, and the atmospheric pressure temper temperature profile. The tool which we use to do that is what we call a global planet formation and evolution model. And this global, I here mean that basically it starts from small object solids, planetesimals or a few runaway bodies, and follows the formation, the growth, the migration, all the time until the nebula is gone, and then even it follows the evolution later on after the protoplanetary disk is gone. This kind of global models, of course, rely on specialized models, because only these specialized models can tell you what is important. In the global models, of course, you lose the, uh, the subtleties of the original, but what you try to do, and this is a difficulty, is to get the essence. Because what is left is then a concentrate of many different effects, and hopefully, and that's the goal, it lets you test the input physics by comparison with observation which is difficult if you just have one specialized model. The challenge in, such, in, in making such a global model is of course to understand how strongly we can distill this physics out of the complex model. This is an example. So we all know that the protoplanetary disks are in reality three-dimensional turbulent uh, objects which can probably can be described by the magneto-rotational instability which is uh, generating turbulence and this we can describe with this equation of MHT. But we also know that we cannot run such a model over a million uh, years, it's just it take, it's taking so long. So we can make a first step in simplification and go to this kind of model. So this is just the standard equation describing the viscous evolution. So we say, okay, we have some viscosity which should somehow originate from this uh, processes here, which we can pack into a parameter, typically the alpha parameter, and then we can look at, in a one-dimensional, so radius, and maybe vertical structure, we can look at the evolution of the gas surface density, here we have the distance, orbital distance, and then you can see how the surface density is, oops, is going down, is going down in, in time. So. The last uh, step is then here. So can we uh, simplify that even more in the sense, can we just assume that we can say, okay, the surface density is something like a power law uh, here with some exponent and it is decreasing as an exponential. And this is the question which we must address and which is not obvi always obvious uh, to answer. Our approach to this question is, is shown here. This is an overview of the global planet formation and evolution model I will use to get the, um, the results later on. It looks relatively complex, but in principle it is just a, a couple of many different standard components. So we have, for example, down here we have the model for the protoplanetary disk, which is an alpha disk, a one plus one dimensional alpha disk, I showed you before. Then here we have a number of modules which describe the the protoplanet, so for example the envelope, the Gaussian envelope, the atmosphere, evaporation of it, the interaction with incoming planetesimals, the structure of the core, orbital migration, and here planet-planet uh, interaction. In this talk here, I will mostly concentrate on these four modules and show them to you in a little bit more detail because these are the modules we mostly use uh, in the results we see later on. The first here is uh, a model which gives us the structure of the planets. So our planets consist of a solid core surrounded by a, an atmosphere of hydrogen and helium. What we want to get here is the radius of the core because that's something we need when we want to compare is uh, the transit observations. And a simple way to describe that is a here one-dimensional model. So we simply solve the equations of mass conservation and of hydrostatic equilibrium. And this gives us then the, the radius 
for the mass and the given composition. You see here examples, so we have the mass radius. Uh, this is for Earth-like composition for something which is 50% uh, ice, 15% rocky, and this is a body which is fully consisting of water. In order to solve this set of equations, we need to have an equation of state which is giving us the density as a function of pressure, and as we are not interested in extremely uh, accurate results, we can use the simplification and say that to first order uh, the density of a solid material is independent of temperature, of temperature and then we have here such a uh, modified uh, polytropic equation of state. But it turns out that still we get relatively good uh, results for the radius compared to more complex models. Then the second uh, ingredient we need is something which tells us First, during the formation, how quickly this solid core we just looked at can accrete gas and then later on, during the evolution, what is the radius and the luminosity of this object. And this is done by uh, solving the one-dimensional radius structure equations, which you probably recognize because they are pr uh, essentially the same as the ones for stellar structures. So we have the equations for mass conservation, and the static equilibrium, that's the same as before, but now we need also to take into account the temperature structure of the object because the gas density obviously depends a lot on the temperature. So we have here this equation for the uh, energy conservation. This epsilon here in stars, usually that's the term where we have the energy production due to nuclear or to hydrogen burning. This is not the case in planets. Here we have other energy sources. During the formation we have impacting planet decimals depositing their kinetic energy. Then if you have relatively massive objects, we can have also deuterium burning. And finally, for low mass objects, we have uh, radiogenic heating due to radionuclides in the core. What we have here is the uh, equation for the energy transport. And depending here, we use the Schwarzschild criterion to decide whether the energy transport is uh, to convection or radiative, and in the case it's radiative, this is just the temperature gradient, and what you see here is the opacity, and I will come back to that later on, because you will see that this is quite important. Now what is going on? We have in the nebula, the core is sitting, and can find some gravitation, uh, through, this, uh, through this potential uh, gravitation potential, it can bind some gas around it. This gas now can cool a little bit, and what this makes is that it is contracting. What this means formally that around the, the gas which is already accreted around the core, formally an empty shell uh, opens. But of course we are embedded in the nebula, which means that the nebula gas is streaming in to fill up this shell. And that's the way that the planet is growing in mass. As the core is getting bigger, this contraction time scale is getting shorter and shorter, which means that more and more gas must stream in to fill up this gap. At some moment, this accretion rate given by the Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction becomes so high that the, nebula, that the nebula cannot deliver a sufficient amount of gas to the planet. And in this moment, the planet is going to, de de to, to detach from the nebula and is going to contract quickly. After this moment, this is the so-called runaway gas accretion we are starting at this moment. After this moment, it's no more the Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction of the uh, core of the planet which is governing the gas accretion rate, but it's rather the ability of the disk to give gas to the planet. And the, and the way we describe these different regimes is basically through the boundary conditions. And uh, this is, you can also say that's the atmosphere. And this is the attached phase I was talking about. So for the low mass plants, there is in principle not even a real boundary or a real atmosphere because the structure is going smoothly to the hill sphere or the, the bond radius. And the pressure and the temperature at this point are basically just the background nebula conditions. For the giant planets, which are in the uh, gas runaway accretion phase, so where the core is bigger than the critical core mass, which is of order 10 Earth masses, there, we basically treat our planet like a miniature star, spherically symmetric star formation situation. So it's very basic, basically. And we assume that we have on the surface, we have an accretion shock for matter which is falling from the hill sphere in free fall onto the planet. And this gives us then, for example, the ramp pressure, or here we have the eddy pressure, uh, and this is just the free fall velocity. 
finally, once the protoplanetary disk is gone, uh, we say that here the planet is just evolving uh, under the influence of its own lumin internal luminosity and stellar uh, irradiation. So we have here the intrinsic luminosity and the equilibrium temperature due to the stellar irradiation and what we then use is a so-called two-stream atmosphere. This is something which is a little bit more complex than a pure gray atmosphere in the sense that it has two characteristic opacities, one for the visual and one for the infrared, and then we can take into account relatively well uh, the effect of stellar irradiation. What we can do with such a model is, is one example here. So this shows you uh, an example for Jupiter. So we first calculated the formation of Jupiter, and then we look, once the formation is over, how its pressure temperature profile is evolving. So here we have temperature, here we have pressure, going down towards here, so it's the interior, and this first line here is uh, the profile just one million year after the end of the formation epoch, and you can see at this moment the planet is still relatively hot, and then in time it's just cooling and contracting, and you can see the last line shows you the pressure temperature profile at the age of 4.6 uh, billion years, and we can compare that with the Galileo probe measurement, and this is working well. You have also to say Jupiter is a case where the simple models work well. Uh, Saturn, for example, would already not work so well. Something we have included only recently is an effect which is important for closing planets. Uh, the Kepler satellite has shown that there are many, many closing, relatively low mass planets. These planets uh, uh, undergo a very strong irradiation from for the star is relatively hard irradiation, so it's especially UV and X-rays. This is just an approximation to write down the UV flux such a planet is going, so these are basically these are measurements, and this is a simple uh, law showing you that at, when the star is young it's more active, so we have a, a, a higher amount of UV irradiation, and this is of course just because when we're further away we get uh, less irradiation. But we then say that, as a first approximation, some part of this incoming flux is used to lift out material uh, from the planetary's atmosphere. And what we need to bring uh, a pro-mass unit, some gas away from the planet, is of course just this potential energy. Then we equate the incoming flux with, uh, the, with the mass loss rate and can solve here for the end, so-called energy-limited uh, um, mass loss rate, which, which is given by this equation here. And the difficult parameter is here, this epsilon, which is the fraction of the incoming UV flux, which is used to lift out material, because of course it can also uh, be just radiated away instead of being used to make PDV work. What we here see is that when the planet is, has a small mass, and when it's close in, then of course the mass loss will be strong. And we also see this depends strongly on the radius, and this tells us that we must uh, treat the radius evolution and the mass loss in a coupled way. These here are just two examples. So here we have a look at a small super-Earth planet. So it has a core mass of about three Earth uh, masses and an envelope mass of 0.01 Earth masses, which seems small, but is still a lot compared, let's say, to the Venusian atmosphere. And then we just look as a function of time how this envelope mass evolves, and we see that it is, of course, decreasing, and the closer in we are, the stronger this process goes. It's interesting to look how the corresponding radius looks like. This, at the beginning, the radius is relatively large, just after formation towards the ADI, and then the planet is contracting and becoming smaller. What is important to note is that even here at 50 million years, when the total mass of the envelope has fallen by a lot, there is still a very large increase in the radius. And this means that even if we have just a little bit of hydrogen and helium, the total radius of the planet is much bigger than the core radius, which is shown here. So, Christoph, how yes. sensitive are your models to the assumptions of this mass loss? Because if you look at, you look at different people's models of mass loss from, say, high Jupiters, they vary by many orders of magnitude. Yeah. So, what, what is. This, it's, it, especially the early models uh, used here uh, an efficient parameter was, was basically one and predicted that even giant planets can evaporate if they are close. Now, what I mean, what you really have to do is basically 
to set up a one-dimensional model where you really solve the equations of, uh, of mass conservation, of energy conservation, and of momentum conservation. And people have been doing that. And what you there get is a typical, depend, you, you basically can then derive this, this epsilon uh, from this comparison with these models. I have to say, I'm only showing you half of the, what was is, which is included in the model we are using, because this is the so-called energy limited domain. There is also a domain where the mass loss rate is rather uh, limited by the recombination of the ions in the upper parts. And therefore, and in this part, then you don't have exactly this epsilon, but you have another dependency on the UV flux. And this limits, for example, the mass loss at early times. To, to come back to your question, I think that we have made tests, and I think when we use these parameters, which are those derived from the more detailed models, then the, the difference is not so huge anymore. This was, this was worse, let's say, five years ago. But people seem to have converged more on lower mass loss rates. Okay, let me go on. Now we, we saw about this, um, this uh, global formation model. I will use that now in population synthesis calculations. And what is the basic idea about planet population synthesis? So we saw about uh, this, this diversity and that we think that this diversity is the consequence of the diversity in the properties of the protoplanetary disk and that this, this translates into the actual planets on the theoretical point of view part. What we now do is we try to derive from observations of protoplanetary disks, we try to derive initial conditions and in particular probability distribution of these initial conditions. So how likely it is that the, that the disk has a given mass or a given solid surface density or a metallicity or a lifetime. And then we run basically our theoretical model for all these different initial conditions many, many, many times. And like that, we generate a population of synthetic planets. And the comparison of these synthetic planets is basically the rest of, of my talk. Here is an output uh, from the global formation model showing you planetary formation tracks. So we start here with a small embryo at about 0.6 source masses and then just let it grow and migrate. And this is, this is what is happening. You see that planets are, of course, growing up and they're also migrating. The colors here give you different types of orbital migration. I don't want to go into details here, but this is basically how we see that the synthetic planetary population is growing. And you can see that depending on in which regime we are, there are concentrations, there are giant planets, there are many close impacts. This takes typically quite, I mean, it, these are all one-dimensional models, so the computation time is, of course, not comparable to a 3D image day simulation, but still, this takes a week or something, or 100 CPUs or something like that. One of the basic uh, predictions now from this kind of models is, of course, the planetary initial mass function, because that is something of obviously very interesting. And I think we can even, uh, without much... Uh, modeling, we can already say what we would probably expect from core accretion. So we see that at low masses, uh, it's mainly the solid accretion which gives us the cores. Then there is a critical mass, and then the planets can accrete a lot of gas. And if we then look at the output of the, of the model, this is also more or less what we can see. So we have here, at the lower masses, we have the solid planets, where this slope is given by a number of processes, like the availability of surface uh, of planetesimals, the core accretion rate, but also migration, because this controls how big our feeding zone is. Then, we see a strong break here around the critical core mass, because at this moment, we can start to accrete gas. Now, it, these are other uh, physical processes which now control the mass of the planet, in particular, the uh, 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 availability of gas, uh, the disk, disk lifetime, and also the formation of the gap in the protoplanetary disk. We can and I should say that other models, which, which also are based on core accretion, at least qualitatively find similar results. We can then look in more details into this, especially this transition zone from the solid-dominated planets to the gas-dominated planets. And this is just an example how we can now play with the assumptions in the models and show and look what, is the, what are the global uh, results of that. So here we have again uh, the planetary mass function now here for about more than 30 Earth masses. And in one of the models, we were assuming in this low accretion here that the accretion rate in the runaway phase is always limited 
by the viscous accretion rate in the disk. While in this case here, you are assuming that the gas which is already in the feeding zone of the planet can be accreted much faster so that you're not limited by the viscous transport, but instead you can accrete here on a body type of accretion rate. This means that in the, so in the second assumption, this transition from maybe 30 Earth masses to 100 or 200 Earth masses is very quick. And this means that it is unlikely that during this time the protoplanetary disk is going away. Therefore, we have here a, a, a local minimum in the mass function. Right? When we have this more slow accretion, we have a more flat part. And this is then something we would like to compare this observation. Here you see a little bit uh, another, an older version of the predicted uh, synthetic mass function. And this is not surprising, it's different at the small masses because that's the place uh, where the model is most incomplete. But what is, in any case, independent of what we typically do is that what the key pre uh, prediction is, is that there are many low mass planets. So, for example, here the model predicts that more than 75% of all planets have a mass which is less than 30 Earth masses. This is the fundamental prediction. If we compare that now with the observed mass function, this is from the HARP survey, which is probably the most complete survey we have at the moment from radial velocity. What is certainly interesting to see is that uh, at the mass of about 30 Earth masses, which is what is more or less what we expect from a 30 to point, there seems to be a, a break in the mass function. The details are, of course, not clear yet. We don't have enough observations, but otherwise, we see that this uh, is similar. And this would be, of course, a very nice indication that core accretion is indeed uh, at work for these planets. In the synthesis, you always have the information what kind of disks give what kind of planets. And this is interesting, especially for the metallicity, because the metallicity is also something which we can measure in reality, assuming then that the metallicity in the disk and the metallicity in the star are basically the same. What you see here is again the planetary mass function that now bind into high metallicity, uh, medium metallicity, and the low metallicity part. And what you can see if we first focus on the giant planets is that at high metallicity, we get a higher number of giant planets. And the mass itself doesn't change much. And this is due to the fact that the metallicity influences the, how big a core can grow. And the, the core then acts more or less like a threshold. If you're above the critical mass, you can become a giant planet, or otherwise you remain a small mass planet. <coughs> if we then compare that uh, with some important observation result, we find the following. One, probably the best known correlation between stellar properties and planetary properties uh, for exosolar planets is, is this year. So if you measure the stellar uh, metallicity and look how frequent giant planets are, then we see in the observation, these are the red and the blue line, you see this relatively strong increase. The black line here is the uh, theoretical prediction. We see that the global trend is reproduced. However, there are differences, and this could, for example, be because the planetesimal formation itself is dependent in a nonlinear way on the surface density, something which is not included here. If we move uh, to, the, uh, to the smaller planets, we see the interesting result that here in the Neptunian regime, there seems to be a weak dependency, and if we go even smaller, there is even an inversion. So it predicts that metal poor systems produce more small mass uh, bodies. We have to be careful because this could be an artifact that we only have one embryo per disk because the situation where in a metal rich disk a giant planet is forming and some small mass planets cannot be captured here. But still, if we look at the observation, this is only possible since we can discover for a few years these low mass planets. This is what we see. So you can have here a histogram of the metallicities first of all stars, this is the blue line, then for, for stars which have a giant planet, this is the black line, and you can see it's clearly shifted towards high metallicities. But if you now plot the histogram of the low mass planets, it's not shifted, and maybe it's even shifted to the lower metallicity. So there is some, uh, it could be that such a, uh, such a dependency is, 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 is actually existing in nature. Let me now talk about another important uh, diagram. This is the mass radius relationship. We have seen it uh, before uh, the observed one. 
what we can do with the, with the, with the um, population synthesis is look at the formation of the mass radius relationship inside of the model. And this is, uh, this is what, what this is done here. So we will follow how planets uh, move from left to right as they grow, and in the same time look at their radius. This here is always the time. Here we are at the very beginning, planets are still have a small mass, and uh, most of them are also dominated by solids, because this, this color scale gives you the fraction of solids in the planet. The rest is hydrogen and helium. Now we can move forward, three million years, now we're in the middle of the planet formation process. And this looks very messy in principle, but we can quickly understand it if we look at one track of a giant planet. So the giant planet starts here as a small mass core, and it's a creating mass. As it's a creating mass, its radius is increased. It, its radius is it, at this time given as the Hill sphere radius, because it's in this attached phase, so its radius is in fact increasing. Then at some point, we have the passage into runaway gas accretion, where the radius is detaching from the disk, so it's coming down uh, to an initial radius of about two or three Jovian radii. As it is continuing to accrete, it is just moving to the right, and here is now relatively degenerate, the radius is more or less independent of the mass, until we hit the mass, which is exceeding certain Jovian masses, and then uh, we start Ethereum fusion. We can continue five million years, uh, 10 million years now, all the protoplanetary this almost all are gone, except here are some. And uh, 20 million years now, the planets are just evolving. You see the effects of the Ethereum burning, which is cooling. And now we start to recognize uh, the normal, so to say, planet mass radius relationship. And we can compare that uh, with the observed mass radius relationship, including only planets which are outside of 0.1 AU, because we don't include any bloating effects. There are so many exosolar planets which are bigger. Uh, that's something to do with the strong irradiation, which is not included here. And what we see is this kind of S shape, with, uh, which is characterized by these empty regions here. And uh, this empty region, and we can, both of them we can understand from, from core accretion. It is, this region is empty because there are no low mass planets which consist almost entirely out of gas. It would be here. And there would also there are also no planets here because this would be rocky cores which only consist out of solids. And this doesn't uh, exist either because they must accrete a lot of hydrogen helium and therefore move here. And this means that we can understand the basic shape of this mass radius relationship uh, from the core accretion paradigm. When we come to the planetary radius distribution, here you can see uh, that uh, we have a strong increase towards the smaller radii, and we have a second peak at about one Jovian radius. And this is clear why we have this peak. This is because when you think of the mass radius relationship, many planets which have different masses all fall into the self same radius bin, and this gives us here this, uh, uh, this maximum. This is something we can predict for Kepler, but only for the larger orbital periods, because at closer centimeter axis, this is probably smeared out by these floating <coughs> effects. And we can compare that with some observational data from the Kepler satellite, and uh, what we see here in red is always the synthetic population blue is the observation result. We have differences at small radii, that's clear, but what is interesting that if we go at large semi-major axis, so including planets out to 1 AU, then it seems that the, there are more giants than large Neptunes, and this is maybe an indication of this peak at the Jovian radius. The next subject I would like to address is the impact uh, of grain opacity. So the main source of opacity in the gaseous envelope of a growing protoplanet are small grains. But these grains, they grow, settle, and evaporate. And this means that uh, the grain evolution models typically predict that the opacity in these protoplanetary envelopes should be much smaller than the opacity in the interstellar medium. And the slower the grain opacity, the faster a uh, planet of a given core mass can accrete gas. And this is what you can see here. Here we have time. Here we have mass, and we can plot this curve for different assumptions for the grain opacity. 
if we assume a full interstellar grain opacity, it takes several million years until the planet goes in runaway gas accretion. This is when it is when the curve is turning up. Right? If we assume that the opacity to grains is negligible, it only takes a few 10 to the 5 years. So we have a lot of dependency here. And if we look at that on the populate, a population wide scale, we see the following. So if we have here again the core mass, and here we get the gas mass, you can see that for a given core mass at low, at full interstellar grain opacity is the red case, we have much smaller uh, envelope masses than we have in the case that we have zero grain opacity. Now, if a core of a given mass has a much more, much more hydrogen helium, this means that its radius is much bigger. And this is something we can observe. And this is, this is shown here. This is basically, again, just a mass radius relationship at 5 billion years. And if we now focus on these planets here, so these are super Earth and Neptunian planets, we see that when we have zero grain opacity, so a lot of hydrogen helium, we have objects which seem bigger than what is observed. Here we have a 0.3 uh, times the interstellar medium grain opacity, which is more or less the prediction from the grain to take grain uh, formation evolution models. We have a similar value. Right? If you go to this case, where a core of a given mass can only accrete uh, a lower amount of hydrogen helium, there the planets seem to be smaller than what is observed. You can see these cases which are above. So we have a certain indication that. Uh, grains are in, the grain opacity is indeed much smaller. The second way to look at that is not only study the low mass planets, but also the bulk enrichment of giant planets. So if we have the mass and the radius measured, we can infer through internal structure modeling how much uh, heavy element metals are contained in a giant planet. And this is shown by the red points here as a function of the mass of the planet. You see low mass planets are more enriched, higher mass planets are less, less enriched. The blue is the synthetic uh, result, again here for zero grain opacity, the nominal value and full interstellar grain opacity. And what you can see if you co compare now the mean, the mean values, these are these lines here, is that uh, for the zero grain opacity, the enrichment levels of the synthetic planet seems to be too low. While here it's more or less similar, and here it is too high. So again, we see as for low mass planets that the grain opacity seems to be much reduced compared to the interstellar medium, but still not completely zero. And I think this is a good example how we can establish a link between ill-known quantities, the grain opacity, but which are important during formation and something which we can observe. And this is typically, if you just look isolated at the grain growth model, this is something which is very difficult. Let me come to the last subject uh, of this talk. The Kepler satellite has certainly kind of revolu revolutionized our view of the radius distribution of planets uh, at close semi-major axis. And more and more there are many studies which really in depth analyze these radius distributions. And there are several puzzling features. For example, if one studies the relative sizes of planets in multiple systems, one typically finds that the density of the planet closer in is bigger than the one which is further out. There are also changes in the slope of the radius distribution. And Kepler has also found many low mass planets low density, which must have hydrogen, helium, but also some planets which are more Earth-like. And um, one of the possible causes for these features could be the evaporation of the primordial hydrogen helium envelope. I was talking about that earlier. We can now look how this affects the global uh, population. What you can see here is the uh, semi-major axis versus mass. At a given moment in time, the color code gives you the fraction of the initial hydrogen helium envelope that has been lost. So one means that the planet has lost all its initial hydrogen helium mass. We can now go in time, forward in time. It's a 10, uh, 100 million years. And here, finally, after one uh, billion year. And what we can see is that most of the action is, of course, happening early on. This is because the flux from the star is larger and the radius of the planets is bigger. And of course, also that low mass closing planets are most affected by that. 
You also note that if you look at the mass distance diagram itself, the position of these uh, planets does hardly change. And the reason for that is that these low mass planets, they might lose all of their envelope, but the fraction of mass of the envelope is, of course, much smaller than the core mass. Therefore, you don't even see them moving. You see it a little bit if you concentrate just on, this, on these planets. You see that they have gone down. So you note that, OK, they lose all the envelope, but we don't really see it in the mass distance diagram. However, if we look at the mass in the distance radius diagram, we see an interesting effect. And uh, this is when we concentrate again on these planets which are affected here. Because we see that something strange has, has appeared. If we, if we uh, zoom in onto that, this is what we see. So we see that uh, here is a kind of a gap which has formed. These here are planets which have lost all their hydrogen helium atmosphere so that their bare core is exposed. And then we have nothing, and then we have planets which have still some hydrogen helium. And why is that? If you think back, you have seen that even if you have just a little bit of hydrogen and helium, then the radius is already much bigger. And this, gives a, this is exactly the explanation for this kind of jump in this region. If you look at the mass, it's continuous, but here we have this clear imprint. So it looks like your models are predicting very, fairly large population of large radius. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Is that something that's observed? No. It's. I mean, it, 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 this is more. There are. There seem to be more planets in this region. It is not as deep. I mean, the slope. You have certainly an increase here towards smaller area. That is more or less similar. However, there is this here. This 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 desert is not as deep in the observation. There could be some indication that if we go further out, that we do have a little bit this kind of this, this two maximum, because right there will be a maximum again at the Jovian uh, radius. This is what I talked before. But closer in, it is, there are more planets in that region. If we go back to this, to this gap that has been formed, we can now make a histogram, of course. And this is shown here. So we have the radius, Earth's radii, and the normalized fraction. And we have here again this peak you are talking about for the giant planets, then we have this increase, and then we have again a decrease. And this decrease is exactly the place where we have made our gap due to evaporation. And if we compare that with observation, this is what we find. I mean, this is just uh, from an analysis of the Kepler data by Petier et al. And what you can see is that here we have certainly a strong increase, and then something like that. So this is flat, I mean, if you look at the other box. And so we cannot say much about that. But one thing is certainly also clear, mainly that this tendency does not continue just down to one or radius. So something seems to be happening. And if you are ready to make your beans much smaller, which might be complicated because of false positives and all these uh, things, this is what you see here. So we have again here the radius and here the number. And now we have this kind of bimodal shape with, again, a minimum at about two uh, Earth's radii. This is from Owen and you, which find a similar effect as we did. So therefore, they are looking for such an imprint. We must be a little bit careful. But what is interesting, if you distinguish here to, between planets which have a low integrated X-ray flux and those which have a high integrated X-ray flux, there seems to be this difference here. So maybe this effect is, is, is real. They just looked at the position and look what kind of star it is. What is now interesting is, of course, that if this is true, we can make predictions about envelope and composition of these planets. Especially, we can say, we can predict, OK, this object should still have some hydrogen helium, or another one should have lost everything. And this is something we want to test in future with spectroscopic uh, missions. From a formation point of view, there is something more which is interesting. Because if you look at this gap of about two Earth's radii, this only arises so clearly in this model because we have here just cores which are made of rocks, so which are relatively small for the mass. If additionally there are planets which are made of ices, they would partially fill in this gap because that's well, what about the size of their core would be. So maybe we could get a, get a constraint on migration models by this kind of studies because these water-rich planets could potentially fit in this gap. And this would certainly be very interesting, because it's a long-standing question whether these objects 
are more, have more formed in situ or have migrated in from beyond of this. Good. Let me come to the conclusions. I think uh, several key mechanisms of planet formation are still not fully understood. Uh, one is accretion of solids, orbital migration, but also the bloating mechanisms. This means that many of the ingredients I showed to you in the global models will be revised, some will be completely abandoned, some will be added. So this is a continued improvement by falsification, and the way to falsificate is the comparison of these uh, observations. The good point is that this global model, based on core accretion, can make many testable uh, predictions for different techniques. And it seems possible, at least in some cases, to tentatively link relatively directly uh, some um, mechanisms occurring during the formation epoch, like the accretion rate or the strength of evaporation, and some observed future. In summary, I think that during the last few years, a certain progress is probably visible in our understanding how planetary systems form and evolve. I must admit that, that this is probably mostly due to the progress on the observation data because we have all this new uh, observational data. But I think that nevertheless also models like the one I showed you can contribute here to understand all this well and uh, improve our understanding. Thank you very much. How do you determine the radius of your gaseous planets? In other words, you know, how do you determine the transition from gaseous planet to rocky planet? So basically what you do is you solve the one-dimensional structure equations. And then you can calculate, if you have a, a given mass, a given composition, and the luminosity, then you can calculate the radial structure, and this gives you the radius. And uh, then basically you do that um, for both the gas component and the solid component. So and this evolves then over time. So the gap in the plot you showed is essentially a complete lack of gaseous atmosphere. Not, Absolutely. Not small, tenuous, low, low optical depth, but yes. nothing. Nothing. Yeah. yeah, the radius I showed before is typically the tau equal to two-thirds radius. But already go then very quickly to, to zero. Okay. <coughs> you did not mention the direct fragmentation of the gaseous disk of yes. all new models. Does it mean that given the wealth of, let's say, 800 plus planets and planet candidates, you can exclude this model on a statistical basis and it's applicable only for a very tiny subset? No, we cannot exclude because basically all the comparison we made addressed planets which are relatively close in. Yes. And if you look even at very simple analytical estimates, you're going to see that it's relatively unlikely to form planets by direct gravitational, by gravitational stability at small semi-major axis. But it's, it's, it's possible. We don't know. But it, if it happens, then it probably happens at large semi-major axis. And that's not what we have directly addressed here. So we cannot exclude it in that sense because we have not addressed it directly. Even, even more, we could... Partially, we have addressed it because if you think of the mass distance diagram, there are basically, here in this model, doesn't predict giant planets outside of, say, 20 AU. You can still invoke uh, scattering, which is not included either, but uh, an equally promising candidate could be the direct uh, gravitational study. It's, it's always still a big risk that, that um, uh, a theory gets more and more complex over time by adding more and more things and uh, there's more and more complicated to test things. You, you, you mentioned here that uh, continuing improvement by falsification. Can you give an example of what has been falsified already from older assumptions? Yes, for example, um, the, if you look at type 1 migration, um, as you know, originally, this was, there was a, an analytical uh, estimate for the migration rate only for the case that the disk is locally isotermal. Mm -hmm. And the migration rate you get from this kind of, 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 of model are basically are always inwards and fast. Mm -hmm. If you now add that into uh, population synthesis model, what you find is that you basically remove a very large fraction, not all, but almost all of the planets 
it can ask how much you did because about that. You remove them just into the star because the migration uh, time scale is so short compared to the this lifetime that you don't are not left this this planet. And this is, I think, a good example how the interaction between specialized models and global models can help to improve that. And it triggered a lot of of research into type one migration. Some of the papers were even uh, in the title, uh, I don't know, type one prescription for population synthesis, because people would, uh, want, are interested in to see what a specialized model does when applied in a global way. So, it seems that the architecture of the planet system you get in the end will be very sensitive to the annual momentum how do you model that actually? You mean in the disk itself? Yes. So you don't model that now should. So um, I didn't talk about this this module which calculates that, but what we are basically are doing is just uh, solving a one plus one dimensional uh, alpha disk model. And, okay. so, so assume that, that the turbulence is small as the same. Yes, it's you don't have that zone? No. Mm -hmm. Might be yes. That's that's true. Um, we are we are working on, on including uh, also dead zones. Uh, this will certainly be important, especially for the migration. This could have uh, strong implications. But we are not yet there. So far, there's no agreement in the theorist community yes. where the dead zone is. That's and also what happens in the dead zone. I mean, what, what one could do is just look what it does for different... That's right. for it's different... Uh, <coughs> of yes, relatives. yes. Right. You alluded to something about single and real vertices. Yeah. Right. Yes, that's probably the strongest simplification in the, in the, in the, the models I showed you. Is that we assume that in one disk just one planet moves. It's as simple as We have now uh, models which, uh, where we have 10 or 20 or 40 embryos which are fully interacting per disk, but uh, we are still working on that. It takes also much, much longer. And this is a, a problem, I mean, if you want to make statistical studies of this. I mean, if you just want to have a handful, then it's fine. But if you need, uh, I don't know, 500 or 1,000, that's, that's an issue. Are there any further questions? If this is not the case, then let's thank Chris again.